our reaction seeking advertisement. We set this to get your attention. In shock, reaction, our purpose, our technique, our method is to break through the clutter so you remember it, you see it, it stays with you. We chose images, the best images we could find of the four people in that car that night. Dodi Fayed, Princess Diana, Henri Paul, Trevor East Jones. And we took a slogan approach, three out of four people agree, seatbelts save lives. We did this a calculated shock tactic campaign so people saw this, remembered it and became aware of it. What we did, and the technical side of our research, we asked people their attitudes to Diana towards road safety and towards the use of her image. We ran a copy testing technique on the three advertisements and we asked for basic personal questions of age, gender and ethnicity. One of the things that we found most notable at this stage, gender, age and ethnicity made no difference to how you felt towards Princess Diana or how you felt towards the road safety. This in marketing research <coughs> is something we hadn't encountered before. Age, cultural differences, gender differences normally impact on your perceptions and impact on your perceptions of advertisements. We had no major difference, no significant difference. In fact, what we saw here, as Rabbi said, the diversity of people who came to the condolences books, the diversity of people, and we had 16 nationalities in our study. We had an age ranging from 18 to 40, university educated and non-university educated. They all shared a common response. So if anything, we have statistical evidence saying she was a global icon. In terms of attitudes to Diana, 70% <coughs> of our respondent group found her to be worth remembering. She was a person that they believed they wanted to remember and that they were going to remember. However, as we move down, less than a third of our sample found her to be meaningful to them. And I stress here that this was an Australian sample. We have not yet had the opportunity to conduct this in America, in Europe, or in England. We may find that amongst Australians in the Australian sample, we may find differences between international samples. In terms of her importance to people's lives, 18%. In terms of her relevance to people's lives, 12%. And what we find most interesting for all of Tony Blair's accolations of she was the people's princess. For our sample, only 12% found her to be accessible to them. And unfortunately, my figures have come in conflict with Rabbi Berman's statement of her accessibility. I must confess a degree of nervousness. And again, I stress, this is Australia, where you and you were and your experiences, we have not yet gone and conducted our research. In terms of the use of her image, the strength and the belief in the persuasiveness of her image, 84% of people believe that using her image in road safety would be persuasive and would be effective. There is such a strength of support for the effectiveness, the persuasiveness, and even <coughs> in terms, really, of the arguments against how many people, less than a third of the group found it the use of her image should be objectionable, and less than that found to be unethical. Of course, this raises a question of pragmatism and ethics, which I'll address later. But what you have to read into this, whilst you see the figures 31%, that's approximately 70% said her image, using her image is not objectionable, and more than 70% said it's not unethical. We have a small group whose feelings will be hurt, who will find this campaign to be distasteful and una unethical, objectionable, but we have more people who would not find that. In terms of the advertisements and their effectiveness, our rather heavy text-based advertorial style was ineffective. People didn't associate 
the car crash didn't associate our image here to Princess Diana. This is not the Diana they want to remember or the Diana they're going to remember. The tunnel is a site, it's a physical place. The car means nothing to them. If it means anything, it would mean something negative and most people disassociate from negative imagery. People were indifferent to the advertisement, they would skip it in the magazine. This had no impact. In terms of our second advertisement, The Tragic Lesson to be Learned, this was our best advertisement. It was the most popular. People with a strong association, both in terms of wanting to remember her, who had significant feelings towards her. The important thing, those who felt strongly towards Diana were encouraged to support the campaign. They found the ad memorable, they liked the advertisement, they found it acceptable. These are the features of an advertisement commercial marketers spend millions of dollars seeking. Social marketers spend hours of work trying to develop your campaign so that it's liked, remembered. These are the stepping stones to behavioural change. This campaign could make a difference. This image, we have found that people who believed in Diana, believe what she stood for, would support the seatbelt campaigns. In contrast, for those people who found Diana to be worth remembering, remember this is 70% of our group, this is the majority. Three out of four people agree had a high initial impact. But even here today, people reacted to it. There was a, you could feel a movement in the room. The first time it aired, there was a nervous laughter amongst the people who viewed it. It's memorable, but it's the wrong method. If you use this campaign, if you were to use shock, it relieves your respondents feeling cold, and it discourages support for the cause. The important thing we have found in this research is that there is a right way and there is a wrong way to use her image. If we had not found no difference between three out of four people agree and a lesson to be learnt, then there was no inappropriate way of using Diana. You could use her image in any format. However, this says quite clearly to use <coughs> this woman's death as a shock tactic, <coughs> as a, just an attention grabber, will cost you support and will cost the campaign. It will be detrimental, it will be counterproductive. So then, the question for us is should we progress the manner? In terms of the arguments <coughs> against the use of her image in road safety, we have our ethical considerations. One of the biggest ethical considerations we have is the Spencer family, the royal family. We have two young boys who have lost their mother in a tragic circumstance. This campaign, if we use her image in road safety, we are reminding them how she died how they lost their mother. We have a small group of people who will suffer. <coughs> we have the objectification, the further objectification. We heard the discussion of the commercialisation of Diana's image. We heard how people said that you can now buy virtually any form of merchandise with Diana. We've seen the Diana Foundation go and support varying causes up to and including margarine with her signature. In the commercial world, the objectification has begun. Whether we as social marketers should be above that or not is a question for debate. Of all of these, one of the most important things is there is the factor of implicit blame. By running this campaign, by saying seatbelts could have saved her, if she had worn a seatbelt, she would not have died. And we say this with conviction because this crash was survivable and survived by the one occupant wearing a seatbelt. If the driver had not been speeding, if the driver had not been drinking, if the driver had not been fatigued, those were factors outside of her control. Diana chose whether 
It was our fault as social marketers for not teaching her better. Diana chose not to wear a safety belt that night. It is what we technically refer to as involuntary suicide. And I heard earlier in the day's proceedings the discussion of the fact that there was a feeling, I believe it was the radio, radio, not to blame her, not to blame Diana. Well, this campaign comes out squarely, says she was wrong, her behaviour was wrong, people do not follow her example but learn from her example. In terms of the arguments in favour, there's effectively really only one argument, and that is, it is effective. Now what, in addressing the ethical concerns of her children, her family, what greater act of nobility could they perform than to prevent other people suffering the pain they are currently suffering? These young boys have lost their mother in tragic circumstances. This campaign, in the effectiveness we believe it would have, would prevent this happening to other people. These two young men, to, who by virtue of birth are in a noble class, a noble position, our leaders have a chance to demonstrate character and leadership in saying, we do not want this to happen to someone else. This has potential to save lives. Her, if people who are currently involved in road accidents, who were unbelted, if in the future, by this campaign, even if only the royals themselves take safety precautions, if one person's life is saved because they took the safety precautions Diana didn't, isn't that enough? And we have the utilitarian ethics. 30% of our population found it unethical. 70 didn't. There are more families, more people who could benefit than just the pain that will be felt by the Spencers and by the royal family. So we bring you back to the question, should we progress the matter? We are saying yes. As social marketers, we are accustomed to being unpopular. We're not in this for the popularity. The campaigns we run on a regular basis seem to be against, seem to be the prevention of sex, drugs, and possibly the outlawing of rock and roll. We are frequently giving you campaigns to tell you to behave yourself, not to eat food you would like to eat, not to drink the drinks you would like to drink, not to behave in a manner you would like to behave. We are frequently used to being unpopular. The second thing, and the thing I have personally noted in this, and stepping away from being the professional social market uh, to the person, all I have seen in the Diana and the legacy, the emotion, it's unfocused. We are looking for a cause. We are looking for something to champion, something to turn around to say, this is for Diana. I've seen calls for parks, roadways, things to be named after Diana. What greater living memorial to the princess than for her to save lives from her death? We do not know how Princess Diana would think today. We know during her life she was not involved in road safety. We know quite categorically road safety had a very low profile in her life. However, what we have heard, what we have heard frequently today, is that this woman went to alleviate suffering. She went out to make people's lives better. What? could be inconsistent with her life's work and to make people's lives better, to make certain nobody suffers the pain her children are suffering. And finally, for this, we can turn what is a tragedy into a legacy of benefit. If her death can make a difference, can prevent a tragedy occurring to another, isn't that what she was about? And the question we have In a life led by example, shouldn't her death be a lesson to us all? Because 
It can happen to her. It could happen to anyone. This brings at home the most famous icon of our contemporary society, universally acknowledged, universally recognised, could die in such a mundane and avoidable circumstance. It says that can happen to any one of us. It brings it home that we are not immune. If she was not immune from such an event, how could we ourselves honestly say, road safety, it couldn't happen to me. It happened to her, it can happen to anyone. Thank you. Any questions for the panel? I think in the interest of some time with regard to uh, people in California, et cetera, we need to ask you, if you have questions, if you could maybe retire a little for tea quickly, and then we're going to... Yeah. Yeah. Just a quick announcement. I have a full conference. conference. Out of the background, right? Yeah. Good. I'd like to welcome all of you to the next panel here at this era of celebrity and spectacle, Diana, a one-year retrospective. Uh, as you know, uh, we are very, very lucky to have Dr. Frederick Maez, who is going to be speaking to us about some of the events that surrounded uh, his treatment of Princess Diana in Paris almost a year ago. If you also look at your program, you can see that we have Dr. Michael Levy, uh, who is going to discuss some of the philosophies of treating accident victims. We also have Dr. Scott Ratson from Washington, who has founded a program in health communication and is also director of the Academy of Educational Development and is going to speak on a number of issues according to Scott with regard to ethics, journalism, and this entire affair. Dr. Myers, welcome. Thank you for welcoming me here in London. Um, so my name is Frederick Maillet. I'm a medical doctor. I'm just a basic, regular medical doctor. And I will go in, I'm going to try to explain to you how I got involved in one of the major the most mediatic event uh, for the last years. This night, uh, almost one year ago, August the 31st, it was a pretty night, really warm, and I was invited in a birthday party in the west suburb of Paris. I went with my best friend, Mark, and since I had to work uh, the next morning at 7 o'clock, the Sunday morning, and I left the party very early, like midnight which is early for me. And then my route, um, yeah, I went back to my, to my place, to my home, and my route goes through the tunnels uh, along the Seine River. <coughs> and while I was approaching the Tunnel de l'Alma, I saw some smoke inside the this tunnel. So I thought, my God, there is a, a fire inside the tunnel. And the traffic in front of me slowed down, so I had the time to see the, the fire, I mean the, the smoke inside the tunnel. And on the other direction, I saw this black car, this black car spinned out on the other direction. I was um, going on, and I was the first car who stopped inside the tunnel, on the middle of the tunnel. I was very close to the Mercedes, and I saw that the, the, the accident just happened because there were, there were almost nobody around the car, and because the smoke which, come, which came from the engine uh, disappeared very quickly. So since I'm a doctor, I had to, to go and to see what was going on. I asked my friend Mark to put a hazard light, in that English, a bacon light, uh, on the roof of my, of my uh, car to give the alert to say, to, to tell to the other cars that there has been an accident and they should be careful. And I went to the wreckage to see what was going on. Since the rear, uh, the rear right door was opened, I could see inside the car what was going on. As um, you know that there were four people in this car. The car was against the wall. The left side of the car was against the wall. So uh, I didn't, I couldn't open or have the access to the left side of the, of the car. The two persons who were on the left side of the car, the driver, Mr. Paul, and Mr. El Fayed, were already dead. They were, we, we say in, 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 in French, uh, in, a, in the status of apparent death. Well, they were dead. And I didn't have the access to, the, to these victims, so I couldn't do anything for them. The two people on the right side 
the bodyguards, Mr. Trevor Lee Jones and uh, Lady uh, Princess Diana, were in a very severe condition. So I examined them quickly, and I ran back to my car to phone the emergency services to tell them I've worked for the emergency services for the for the fireman brigade, so I know exactly what they they, they have to know. Uh, so I, it was very quick. I said, "Listen, there have been a, an accident on the tunnel underneath the tunnel de, du Pont de l'Alma. Uh, one car, um, four people, two apparently dead, two severely injured." I need at least two emergency ambulances plus the, the equipment for this kind of accident. And after that, I went to my trunk to get the equipment I had. I was off duty this night. I came back from a birthday party, so I didn't have all the equipment I, 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 sh I usually have. Usually I have uh, something to take the blood pressure. I didn't have even this, this, this equipment. I only had the resuscitation mask, what we call an ambu bag. So I ran back with this ambu bag, with this resuscitation mask. I ran back to the wreckage to give the first help to the victims. Uh, while I was running to the to the wreckage, a volunteer fireman was um, walking also to the wreckage, and he began to give the first help to to the volunteer fireman, to the excuse me to the bodyguard. So I didn't have any choice. The only person I could help was this young lady who was sitting on the floor of the, of, the, of the car between the two rows of seats. She was turning her back toward the, the door and she was facing Mr. El Fayed, actually, the, the left side of the car. She was unconscious. She wasn't bleeding. She, her face was still intact, pale, of course. And I didn't recognize her. I know it's quite surprising because she was uh, one of the best known person. Her face, her picture was in every papers, every newspaper. But my attention, you know, was focused on the medical situation. I was the only doctor in front of four severely severe victims. Plus, uh, I. Um, I didn't have any time to to real to really think about that and figure out who she could be, so I didn't recognize her. I gave her the first help. That means trying to help her breathing because she had some difficulties to breathe because she was unconscious. We spoke with the fireman. Uh, I tried to I checked what he was doing and we spoke a little bit, sharing who sharing um, what we were doing. And this time, waiting for the emergency ambulances uh, seemed to me like an eternity. Actually, it was like I checked afterwards. It was like six or seven minutes. The first ambulances, the first uh, emergency services arrived six or seven minutes after my call. But six or seven minutes alone as a doctor who knows what you can, what I should do, but without any equipment, without any nurse, without large emergency ambulances, it was extremely st stressful for me, and it looked like an eternity. While I was kneeling, kneeling, do you understand, kneeling on in the rear seat of the Mercedes, and uh, giving the first help to Princess Diana. There was a lot of people behind me in my back uh, taking a lot of pictures with a lot of flash. I was aware of that because I saw a lot of flash uh, in the car. Uh, but once again, my attention was focused on, on my victim, on my patient. So I didn't have the time to figure out why there were so many photographers. Sometimes it's not the first time I see accidents uh, outside of my job while I was while I'm off duty. And sometimes there are photographers, there are journalists um, passing by and taking some pictures. But this time, there were a lot of photographers, a lot of pictures taken. I didn't have any answers to, to my question why they, they were there. And um, someone in my back told me that the victim 
spoke English. Nobody told me who they were, but someone in my back, I guess, I assumed he, he was a paparazzi, told me that um, they spoke English. So I began to speak English, and I tried to comfort her, saying that I was a doctor, that the ambulances were on the way, that everything was going well, everything will be fine. You know, this kind of sentence you say to just make your patient a little bit more comfortable. I tried also to ask some questions about her medical status or, you know, the beginning of the medical in questions, but of course I didn't get any answers. As soon as the first emergency services arrived, uh, I gave them my medical assessment. I told them how I found my victim, my patients, and how um, what I've done for them. And after that, I wasn't useful anymore. I didn't have to stay because it would have put me in a situation of just curiosity, and I, didn't, I don't like to, to be this way. So I left. Uh, I left the wreckage, and after that, w I went to my car, and we left the scene because I didn't know who she was, and I have done my duty. I didn't have to stay. With my friend Mark, we we were wondering why there were so many photographers. We couldn't get any any answers uh, that night, and it's the next morning. Uh, just before going to work, I uh, turned on the, the television, and of course, every channel uh, spoke about uh, Princess Diana's death. And I've learned in five seconds that Princess Diana was uh, dead, and she died in, a, in Paris in a car crash underneath the Pont de l'Alma. So I discovered suddenly that the young lady that I've treated was Princess Diana, and that she died a few hours later after I left the scene. You can imagine the, 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 sh the shock um, I felt um, this morning. But well, it's not the first time I'm treating someone who dies after a few hours, and it's not the first time I'm treating someone who is really famous, because in Paris there are a lot of movie stars and, and, and people famous. So. That's it. And I'm going to my work because I have to work. And we speak, I'm, I'm working with other colleagues and we hear the radio and uh, I say, oh, I was there and my colleagues asked me some questions and we speak a little bit about that. But I don't really think that what I've done and what I've seen was so important. Um, I'm listening to the radio, and the only message I remember shocked me. It was, it's a paparazzi's fault. They killed her. They behaved very badly. They hampered, is that English? They hampered uh, the emergency services to arrive, and they hampered them to, to, to work because they wanted to get the best picture. And I said, no, I, I, was, I was there, and I really remember that they, they, they didn't hamper me doing my job. They didn't hamper me having the access to the victims. I didn't ask, ask them to help me, so they didn't refuse to help me. They, they did that, their job, and I did my job, and that was fine. I'm not speaking about the, the, the accident. I, didn't see the accident. I don't want to do any comment about the accident and what, what caused the accident. I'm speaking about the time I was there. And while I was there, the paparazzi did their job and I did my job, and that's, that, that was fine for me. And when I heard this uh, journalist speaking about uh, this accident, um, I disagree with, with them. But well, uh, that's it. And uh, in the afternoon after my work, I'm going to a restaurant where uh, I used to go, Joe Allen. And um, I know the, the owner, I know, uh, I know a lot of people, and we have a drink together. And uh, I speak, of course, about this 
event. And my friends 